Welcome to section one of gastrointestinal anatomy. In this section, we will be discussing the peritoneum and the mesentery. So let's get started. There are two components of the peritoneum, the visceral peritoneum, which lines the organs, and the parietal peritoneum, which lines the rest of the cavity. This image shows a sagittal view of the peritoneum of the abdominal cavity, and it can be found in your gastrointestinal anatomy text in section one. Notice all these structures. We've got the liver and intestines. These are all covered by visceral peritoneum. Everything else in this cavity is covered by parietal peritoneum, as you can see labeled here. So again, we have parietal peritoneum covering everything in the intraperitoneal cavity, except for the visceral peritoneum, which covers the organs and the intestines. Now bring your attention back to the liver. When we look at this visceral peritoneum right here, we can follow this down until we reach the lesser omentum, which is this right here. And then we continue following it. We see it covers the stomach. Then it becomes the greater omentum, comes back, and is covering the colon, as you can see here, the transverse colon specifically, and then it extends backwards until it reaches the abdominal wall, specifically the posterior abdominal wall. So again, we just showed the lesser omentum and the greater omentum. And since these are covering the organs, they are both visceral peritoneum. And more specifically, they are double layers of peritoneum, and that's what makes them omentums. After all, it's covering right here. This is a single layer covering the stomach, and then it extends down and then starting from the other side, we can see that it comes down. And this is, of course, a single layer right here until we reach the lesser omentum, which is a double layer. And then we see that we've got a double layer now. So these omentums are double layered, as we've just discussed. So now let's focus on the term mesentery. Mesentery refers to a double layer of peritoneum. And within the mesentery, you have arteries and veins. And these supply the intestinal tract. And as we just discussed, the lesser omentum is an example of mesentery and the greater omentum is an example of mesentery. This is an anterior view of the abdominal cavity, and it can be found in section one of your gastrointestinal anatomy text. And looking anteriorly, we see this double layer of visceral peritoneum forming the lesser omentum, which we've labeled right here. This is a double layer, which we mentioned on the previous two slides. And then on the right, we see the greater omentum is labeled. This also is a double layer of peritoneum, which makes it a mesentery. Now let's go to this table. The lesser omentum has two rows because it has two parts. It has a hepatogastric ligament and a hepatoduodenal ligament. The hepatogastric ligament contains gastric vessels, where the hepatoduodenal ligament contains the portal triad. And this portal triad consists of the hepatic artery proper, the portal vein, and the common bile duct. Now a clinical tie-in is the Pringle maneuver. In an operation, surgeons can clamp the portal triad in order to decrease bleeding from the liver. And that makes sense. If you clamp the portal triad, you're clamping the hepatic artery proper, which supplies blood to the liver. And if you clamp the portal vein, you're also decreasing the venous blood that goes to the liver. So ultimately, the Pringle maneuver will decrease bleeding from the liver during an operation. So again, this is the lesser omentum, and we have the gastrohepatic ligament, or the hepatogastric ligament. So gastro for stomach, and hepatic for liver. So it's the hepatogastric ligament. And we also have the hepatoduodenal ligament, and that's this portion right here. And as you can see, it extends from the duodenum, right here, to the liver, right here, and it contains the portal triad. Now let's focus on the greater omentum. This has three components, the gastrophrenic ligament, the gastrosplenic ligament, and the gastrocolic ligament. The gastrosplenic ligament extends from the posterior surface of the stomach to the spleen, where the gastrocolic ligament extends from the posterior surface of the stomach to the transverse colon. Now we have labeled here the gastrophrenic ligament, and this isn't as important, so we're not going to discuss this further. But you can deduce what it is based on the name. Gastro for stomach, and phrenic for diaphragm. So it connects the stomach to the diaphragm. But really, we're going to focus on these two major components, gastrosplenic and gastrocolic ligaments. So we're going back to the table, we have the greater omentum, which has two components, the gastrocolic ligament and the gastrosplenic ligament. And you can deduce their location and their purpose based on their names. Gastrocolic, so stomach to colon, specifically the transverse colon. And gastrosplenic goes from stomach to spleen. Now focusing just on the gastrocolic ligament, we see something interesting. It connects to the transverse colon only, not the ascending and descending colon. This fact is a helpful way to remind you that the ascending colon and the descending colon are retroperitoneal, so they wouldn't connect to the greater omentum, whereas the transverse colon is intraperitoneal and is therefore accessible and can connect to the greater omentum. With respect to the transverse colon, when I use the term intraperitoneal versus the term retroperitoneal with reference to the ascending and descending colon will make more sense in a few slides. But for your convenience, we've written this here. The ascending and descending colon are retroperitoneal. 
That means they do not connect to the greater omentum. And the gastrosplenic ligament contains branches of the splenic artery and the splenic vein, specifically the short gastric artery and vein and the left gastroomental artery and vein. And by the way, another name for gastroomental is gastroepiploic. So we just discussed the two main components of the greater omentum, the gastrosplenic ligament and the gastrocolic ligament. Now let's discuss the splenorenal ligament. As its name implies, it connects to the spleen. What's less intuitive is that it connects to the posterior abdominal wall, whereas the title indicates it should be connecting to the kidney. The reality is it connects to the wall at the level of the kidney, and for that reason, we call it the splenorenal ligament, and this contains the splenic artery and vein. Now this may be confusing because we just said that the gastrosplenic ligament of the greater omentum contains branches of the splenic artery and vein, and this is an important distinction. The splenorenal ligament is actually what contains the splenic artery and vein itself, whereas its branches are contained within the greater omentum. And this is important to keep in mind. And from this image, you can't really see the splenorenal ligament because it's tucked behind here. So an axial cut will be better at showing us the splenorenal ligament. This image can be found in section one of your gastrointestinal anatomy text. And right now, I want to draw your attention to the splenorenal ligament labeled here. Now, thankfully, we can also see the gastrosplenic ligament right here which again is right here. We're just seeing it at a different angle now. And as we mentioned, the splenic artery and vein are located within the splenorenal ligament, but the branches of the splenic artery and the branches of the splenic vein are located in the gastrosplenic ligament. And this distinction can be fairly intuitive if you look at it from this perspective. Anything that branches directly off of the aorta, i.e. at the celiac trunk, would stay retroperitoneal back in this region until it reaches its destination. And so it's traveling this way, and it reaches the spleen. And this course is best traveled through the splenorenal ligament, which is posterior, closer to the posterior abdominal wall. And then the branches can extend anteriorly going through the gastrosplenic ligament. And that's how you get the short gastrics and the left gastroepiploic or left gastroomental vessels covering the stomach. The last item to discuss on this table is the falciform ligament. And this extends from the anterior portion of the liver to the abdominal wall, obviously the anterior abdominal wall. And within the falciform ligament, there are paraumbilical veins, and these are what form caput medusae, or the umbilical varices, seen in liver cirrhosis. These umbilical varices are formed when the paraumbilical veins connect with the superficial epigastric veins. This shows an anterior view of the liver and can be found in section one of your gastrointestinal anatomy text. And right here, we can see the falciform ligament, and this falciform ligament connects to the abdominal wall. Notice that within the falciform ligament, we have the ligamentum teres. In fetal development, the umbilical vein would travel through the liver, through this pathway, and deliver oxygenated blood to the heart. This closes at birth and forms the ligamentum teres. So I will show these yellow lines to demonstrate fibrotic tissue, which closes off this ligamentum teres. Now in portal hypertension, this ligamentum teres can recanalize, and therefore blood can flow from the liver to the anterior abdominal wall and form caput medusae. Again, this is with the superficial epigastric veins. So now that we've discussed everything from this table, let's do a question to apply what you've learned so far. An 18-year-old female with sickle cell disease suffers infarction of her spleen during a sickle cell crisis. Surgical removal of the spleen is planned. As part of the procedure, the splenic artery and vein will be ligated. What ligament must be cut to reach these vessels? Do you remember which ligament contains the splenic artery and vein? It's the splenorenal ligament. Recall from the table that the splenic artery and the splenic vein are contained within the splenorenal ligament, whereas its branches are contained within the gastrosplenic ligament, which is more anterior. And we can see the splenorenal ligament right here. Now let's do another question. A 45-year-old male experiences massive hemorrhage following perforation of a peptic ulcer within the lesser curvature of the stomach. He is hemodynamically unstable upon arrival to the emergency department. Emergent laparoscopic surgery is started. The surgeon plans to cauterize the bleeding arteries in order to achieve hemodynamic stability. Which of the following structures contains the vessels that will most likely be cauterized? A, the gastrosplenic ligament. B, the gastrocolic ligament. C, the splenorenal ligament. D, the hepatoduodenal ligament. Or E, the hepatogastric ligament. Now hopefully you recognize that the vessels bleeding are on the lesser curvature, which includes the right and left gastric arteries. And recall that the mesentery containing the right and left gastric arteries is the lesser omentum. Now, which of these choices, A, B, C, D, or E, are components of the lesser omentum? Well, we know it's not the gastrosplenic ligament because this connects the greater curvature of the stomach to the spleen. So it's not related to the lesser curvature of the stomach. The same is true for the gastrocolic ligament. 
it applies to the greater curvature, and the splenorenal ligament isn't connected to the stomach at all, so we can cross that out. This leaves us with D and E, and both of these are part of the lesser curvature. But which portion contains the right and left gastric arteries? Well, the hepatoduodenal ligament contains the portal triad, and the hepatogastric ligament, which is actually connected to the stomach, as opposed to the duodenum, contains the right and left gastric arteries, as well as the right and left gastric veins. So we cross off choice D, and our answer is choice E. Now we can see that going back to the table. The hepatoduodenal ligament contains the portal triad, whereas the hepatogastric ligament contains the gastric vessels. Looking at the anterior view, we can see the gastrohepatic ligament right here. This contains the gastric artery and veins, whereas the hepatoduodenal contains the portal triad. And you can see the hepatogastric ligament right here on this axial cut. And you can even see an indication of these vessels right here within the hepatogastric ligament. Now the last topic is very straightforward. It's the retroperitoneum. This is located behind the parietal peritoneum on the posterior abdominal wall. Going back to this picture, we can clearly see all the interperitoneal structures, everything within the interperitoneum. So this all includes the intestinal structures, the liver, and all the mesentery. However, anything behind this cavity is retroperitoneal. So here and back is retroperitoneal. Now in the retroperitoneum, there are non-intestinal structures and there are intestinal structures. The non-intestinal structures include the aorta and the inferior vena cava, as well as their associated branches. Also, the pancreas, kidneys, ureters, and the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, are also non-intestinal or retroperitoneal structures. Now the intestinal structures include the duodenum. However, this does not include the first part of the duodenum. Other intestinal structures include the ascending and descending colon, as well as the rectum. Now this part right here, that the first part of the duodenum is not included in the retroperitoneum, is kind of hard to understand at first. So let's look at it this way. If you've handled a cadaver, recall that the stomach can be grabbed with your hand. This is because the stomach is intraperitoneal and not shielded in the retroperitoneum. Extending from the stomach is the duodenum. Now the duodenum doesn't immediately go into the retroperitoneum. It needs a chance to make this deep retro dive. So the first part of the duodenum should be considered part of the stomach with reference to the retroperitoneal structures, whereas the rest of the duodenum is part of the retroperitoneum. So the first part of the duodenum is intraperitoneal and the rest of the duodenum is retroperitoneal. Now this image shows an axial cut of the retroperitoneal structures and can be found in section one of your GI anatomy text. And we can see the kidneys labeled here. And of course the ureters will descend from the kidneys. So those would be retroperitoneal. Likewise, the adrenal glands, which would sit on top of the kidneys, would be retroperitoneal as well. I'll just write AG for short. Now we have the IVC and the aorta. These are retroperitoneal. And then we have the duodenum, which we can see on this side as well. Don't get wrapped up in the jejunum. For the most part, just think of the small intestine, excluding the duodenum, as being intraperitoneal. And then, of course, we have the ascending colon and the descending colon. Another retroperitoneal structure not shown is the rectum. If we go back to this sagittal cut, we can see the rectum, and clearly it's retroperitoneal. It can be difficult to remember which structures are retroperitoneal. For this reason, I have prepared a memory hook to help you keep this straight. Now this image depicts all of the structures you need to memorize as being retroperitoneal. It is explained in great detail in GI section 1.1, the next video, so I won't go into any more detail here, but you'll find it very helpful in helping you remember those structures. And something very clinically important is to understand retroperitoneal structure injury. If there's trauma to a retroperitoneal structure, you can expect organ dysfunction, which is fairly intuitive. If you damage an organ, you're going to have organ dysfunction, but what's less intuitive is the hematoma that ensues. And this hematoma, or collection of blood, is contained within the retroperitoneum. And this is what you need to remember. If you have a lot of blood collecting in the retroperitoneum, it can compress local structures, the most important of which are the IVC and the aorta. If significant pressure is exerted on these structures in the form of a hematoma, you can get hemodynamic instability. The next important thing to remember is that if you have damage to a retroperitoneal organ, Suspect that other retroperitoneal organs are also damaged. And that concludes this section.